Okay, so what I was saying, um, basically, I hear, I, I hear it all so often that people go out and they buy the bike, they buy all the kit, and they're like, yeah, I'm going to start doing enduro, and they do it once, and they realise it's not for them, and then their bike sits in the garage for five months a year, and it was probably a huge waste of money. So if, but I think my, one of my recommendations here, if it's possible, it does cost a little bit of money, but a lot less than buying all the kit, is to find somewhere where you can go and hire a bike, borrow all the kit, and have a play for the day. A lot of the places like this, I know that in the UK and Europe, there's loads of them, so Megs, you might need to jump in for like the other side of the pond. Um, but you can then have a go on a different selection of bikes, have someone that knows what they're doing there with you, which is always helpful, borrow all the kit, and you haven't got that massive straight up investment before you even know if it's actually something that you're going to fall in love with, because it's not for everyone. If it was for everyone, we'd all be rapping all the time. Um, so that's probably my first tip. If you can, do it. You don't have the maintenance of the bike then, you can get out and have a play. Um, so that's kind of like the first thing I came to mind on that one. Okay. Yeah. Makes <laughs> sense. Yeah. Um, we do have places like that out here too. I don't think there are as many. It's, it's kind of hard to find places that rent bikes. Um, but we do and have them. We have a local spot here, uh, a local track that does it. Um, Popcom. Come to England! <laughs> um, but if you can't go out and rent a bike, you can always... Um, if you have friends that ride, try their bikes and stuff like that, right? Um, mm. If it you're like, like they've just commented at some places as well, so we'll have a, have to have a look and see where people are suggesting. I've just seen a few comments pop up on places where you can rent bikes. That's pretty cool. Nice, awesome. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, and if you're like me, when I first started, I didn't know anyone who rode. Um, and I didn't do any research or anything and I, I powered through it. But now going back, I would have definitely done some more research. So there's so much information online. Um, you go on Instagram and there's tons of people who ride. You can, you can ask for advice. You can see what beginners are choosing um, for what type of terrain you want to ride. The biggest thing I would say for people who are just getting into riding is don't have an ego so don't go out there and be like well you know what i'm gonna buy a 300 because graham jarvis rides a 300 or i'm gonna buy a 450 because it's the biggest bike there is um just i like put the, the ego, <laughs> put the ego away tell it no and yeah. really i get the bike that um is going to suit the type of riding you do and that isn't going to scare you right off the bat so i'm talking like something a little bit more mellow maybe even get like an air-cooled honda or something if you're totally new to riding right because if you get a bike that's just too much to handle and too intimidating to ride uh it may turn you off of riding altogether even though you could have potentially loved it so um you can make learning curve so much harder as well because the bike's not designed for a newbie to to ride so it can make everything harder because you're exactly. basically riding a little bit <laughs> yeah and that that exact same thing happened to me so yes i started on a smaller bike uh ttr 125 but um as i grew out of that i never physically grew out of it <laughs> um i switched to a 250 motocross bike it was an kx 250f that was done up for um freestyle so it had suspension on it for hitting 100 foot ramps and i had no idea i was so new and i was out riding in the gnarly single track on this two by four of a bike and i specifically remember when i first bought it okay so this is my first time you know getting used to the bike after i had a smaller bike um I would rev it, like I'd start it and then I'd rev it and I'd be shaking from the fear and the adrenaline of the power of a 250F. And I mean, that seems silly looking back, but it's not silly at all. If you're, if you're not, if you're new to it, it's a lot of power. So I want to say that may have actually held me back a little bit, it, like looking back, but I've still become a great rider and anyone can, you don't need the perfect bike, but 
it's just ideal to start on something that will help you learn and help you gain skills quickly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to read the question because it just made me smile so much. Um, and it's blatantly not talking about me. It's talking about you, but I just loved it. Okay, so how do I encourage my girlfriend to be as badass as you and start riding? <laughs> <laughs> I love this we need more girls out there riding now right. i guess uh i'm gonna jump straight in on this it, it is intimidating they are big bikes it is a male dominated sport a lot of sports are male dominated so it's just the way it is but i think my advice for a, a boyfriend partner husband wanting to get their other half into into riding is really about nurturing that and making it something that's really enjoyable for them. Not the, you know, get rid of the egos and the like doing wheelies next to them and pissing around with their baits. Be there with them, learning with them, teaching them. And if you invest the time into them now and help them really develop their riding, you'll be off riding around with the lads together later down the line. But right now what you need to do is help co coach them, teach them, have patience, understand that it is different for for a you know a small girl riding on these big bikes it, it's not the same um and i think that you sort of i think as actually i think a big one that would be a recommendation if um it links to if you feel like you fall off all the time and you're worried about getting hurt could be actually getting them into trials it's a lot slower it's a, a cheaper investment because generally in trials you don't wear all of the protective gear you could wear i mean you could wear mountain boots and uh, hiking boots and a helmet and you'd be okay starting on trials you can work on all of those foundations of balance and clutch controls and build their confidence um be in it together and enjoy it really uh, i think the ego and the ladness just kind of Put that away and if you can't put that away when you're around your mates then have some dedicated time riding the two of you um but the time you invest now will be like epic riding later just think of that short term yeah. long term i totally agree i mean <laughs> if you put someone in over their head all the time and make it super scary and make it yeah. seem really daunting and it it's not going to be fun for them and i from personal experience when I first started I remember I met some people at school that rode okay and they were guys and they raced in the local off-road circuit and this is this is when I still rode the TTR 125 and I remember being absolutely petrified that they were going to take me on a single track like <laughs> I would I would be saying constantly like please please don't lead me down something I can't do please don't lead me down something I can't do and um so when I'm teaching someone, um, I feel like you gotta, you gotta give them confidence that they can trust you, um, where you're leading them and where you're taking them and then push them just a little bit so they can have little successes. And when you start to have success, whether it's really small or really big, uh, you gain confidence. And then with confidence, you ride better and you progress more quickly. So you just have to be patient and, um, don't do something stupid. Don't be like, it's easy. And take them on a double black and be like, well, if you can't hang, you're, you're a turd. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we all make mistakes. It's, nobody's perfect, but um, you just, you have to give them, um, make it so they can trust you. And so they're, they're not scared all the time because then it's not fun. Yeah. But mm. yeah. All right. Um, okay, so how how are we feeling on time, people? Uh, are we are we still listening and enjoying it and engaged? Should we keep going now? Do we want to do another ten minutes, twenty minutes? Comments. Let us know what you think we should do. We've got a few more really cool topics, basically. Um, so let's see what. Well, we've got, we're getting lots of thumbs up. <laughs> Just, thumbs up must okay, mean all right. <laughs> Thumbs up if you want us to continue. <laughs> All right. Okay. We're awesome. Okay. Um, oh, okay. okay. 
Um, so the next one uh, that we're going to cover is riding tech. So a uh, bunch of you sent in some questions about how do you do steep hills uh, when they're, they've got obstacles on them? So rocks, roots, ledges, little steps. And so this is kind of going to be like a bit of a lesson, I guess. Um, but hill climbing, okay. So first things first, hill climbing is more than just twisting the throttle. It's all about momentum, but sometimes you're going to need to control your momentum without letting off on the gas, because we all know that as soon as you let off on the gas, you're hooped. You're going to start spinning or you're going to loop your bike out. Um, moments where you might want to let off would be like with, if your front end starts coming up, right? Or if you hit a rock and get bucked sideways, or maybe you see some rocks coming up and you need to just let off a little bit. Instead of letting off on the throttle, you're going to want to use your clutch to control that forward momentum. So as that front wheel starts to come up when you don't want it to, just pull in your clutch just a little bit and control that. Keep it down. Your body... You're going to get your weight forwards to keep that front end down, right? So that's, and I'm going to try really hard not to ramble and talk really fast. So Vanessa, you need to like keep me in check here, but that's, I can't want to get into like the bike position so that I can do it as you say. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. So that's just going up a hill. Okay. Um, when it okay. comes to obstacles, rocks and roots that, it's really going to come into play with the clutch. So you're going to have to, you can't always power through. You're going to have to know when to let off a little bit so that you're not going to be looping, but it's not letting off on the gas. It's feathering your clutch. This is something that's really hard to um, teach over the phone. Um, but what we need to do is book a flight and come over and see you for a training day. Well, right. I mean, what are y'all waiting for? <laughs> um, but no. I'm in. <laughs> so, so here's something that can probably help all of you. Um, can you see me? I need to be standing for this. Um, yep. So when you're on a nasty hill and there's roots and rocks, the first thing you're going to want to focus on is keeping your feet on the pegs, right? So standing up. As soon as you're sitting down, you've lost control, you're gonna get bucked all over the place. You wanna be standing up so that that bike can move underneath you, but you can stay in control. The next thing, um, it happens to the best of us. You get, you, you get bucked off and you end up sitting down. Okay, no big deal. What you're gonna focus on now, if you can't get back up on your feet, is to at least keep all the weight on one foot peg. This way you still have traction and you still have control and you're, you're still waiting that peg, right? And you keep that up until you can get your crap together again and get back on track, balanced and standing. So that's one thing that will really, really help you guys on gnarly hills. If you can just keep your weight on the foot pegs or even just one peg at the very least, um, because sitting down isn't gonna work on, on, on technical hills. Um, especially if it's slippery, you, you need to be standing up and in control. Um, I don't, I, it's really hard to explain. <laughs> I, need my I, like, I think it's a pretty difficult one to chat through on a webcam. <laughs> right. Right. With no bike, no hill. <laughs> right. So, yeah, no, I think it's pretty helpful. So I'll, I'll just, I'll just quickly next. recap it. Um, number one, um, you're not going to want to let off on the throttle on a hill. So you need to use your clutch to control that forward momentum. Number two, standing up, um, as much as possible. And if not, number three, if you end up on that seat, make sure you're weighting one of your foot pegs. Even if you're dabbing with the other foot, keep weight on that other foot. And, um, that should help massively. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, while we're talking about bike technical riding, I'm very aware um, that COVID-19 is 
rather impacting the world right now. So, I mean, here in the UK, we're on, on full lockdown. I haven't left the house um, other than for a little run or recycle for daily exercise for 15 days now. Um, and, you know, people people are dying. So I really hope that anyone watching um, is, is staying safe and that your friends and family are, are doing okay. But going back to the bikes, we can't ride them right now, but I do think there are things that we can be doing in home lockdown that will help us for when we do get back on the bikes and make it so that we've come through isolation, we come out stronger. And I think the biggest one for that is balance. Um, I've actually got some really silly YouTube videos. If you, if you find me on YouTube, the sock challenge. And yeah, that is about putting your socks on. And um, there's even a headstand challenge. Um, so have a go at those. But even wherever your bike is parked, can you just start trying to balance on it? And it might be that you can only balance for a split second. But if you do 10 minutes every morning, 10 minutes every afternoon, every day, I can always guarantee you by the end of isolation, not that we know how long that will be, you'll either be a pro balancing your head by the end of isolation, <laughs> but how long it will be. But it will help your bike skills. So I think it's, uh, it's a cool one that we can uh, take advantage of in some ways. Yeah, definitely. I agree. Um, yep. Okay. The next one, oh, this is quite a fun topic. We've had quite a few questions about sort of big challenges that we've had. Um, so do you want to go, go straight ahead? The question is, what's the, the longest ride or hardest course or one or the other or both combined that you've done? Um, okay. So the first thing that always comes to mind would be my experience at the ISDE in Spain. And so that's six days on the bike. Right. And um, it was actually one of the toughest ISDEs in in years because of the length of the days. So we had some days that were between nine and 10 hours long. And so it was gnarly. Mm -hmm. But the I got to be standing for this. It's just so the, the I need to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so the hardest thing about it for me was battling through um a nasty injury so when i got there my goal was to finish i wanted a bronze medal because i had done a big fundraiser i had lots of friends and family back home that were like hoping for me to finish and so it was really really important to me that i finished and everyone that had done an isde before it was my first time but all these people had um said okay it's your first time so whatever you do make sure you don't break your bike or your body just finish just worry about keeping the rubber side down and finishing and i was like well yeah obviously totally cool and then within the first hour of the first day i flew off an embankment landed flat on a road and knocked myself unconscious and separated my shoulder and i woke up and you guys aren't even going to believe this. Some of you have heard the story, but I woke up four hours later on the bike riding. So, and I saw, found some footage later on. Um, some Spanish dude had dragged me off the course. I guess I came to and started yelling, put me on my bike, where's my bike? And he propped me on my bike and I took off with both legs flying. And it, there's footage of it out there somewhere. I had a bunch of tape wrapped up in my wheel dangling and I peeled off and then I have no recollection of four hours of that race. And apparently I went up like a absolutely crazy riverbed because um, like six hours into the, into the race that day, I came to this riverbed again and it was my first time seeing it. And I, it was crazy. I got to the top after a bunch of struggles, um, bunch of people laid out some pushing, hyperventilating i got to the checkpoint at the top and the guy was like well you cleaned it on the first lap what happened and i was like what first lap and he was like Ugh. and so i did it and i didn't even i don't even remember it because i was so messed up from knocking myself out and anyways long story short i had to do the six days with a separated shoulder but i couldn't go to the the isde medics because they would probably deem me unfit to race and Team Canada didn't have a medic. So I was just like, my shoulder was basically dangling out of the socket. 
and I just remember you have to push your bike up the ramp every morning to start. You can't, you can't turn it on or you're disqualified. And every morning was the, the most painful because it was so, you know, seized up mm -hmm. from sleeping and pushing it up that ramp was just like a tear streaming down my face. And I'm just like, Oh my God, like here goes another 10 hour day. And, but it was just probably the toughest thing I've ever done mentally um, in my life. Uh, I, I will admit it was horrible. <laughs> um, but looking back it's all I want to do now is try again without an injury because I think I've come a long way and um, I don't know, I just want to try it again without the, all that pain. Um, but I did finish and I did get a bronze medal. Um, but yeah, yeah, and I, I do have some good stories from it, but maybe next time I'll bring up some of the epic stories with the Slovakia <laughs> girls. <laughs> Amazing. Um, okay, so my one, um, I'm going to separate my longest and my hard one into two short stories. So I think my longest one, I was uh, adventure riding on Tiger 800s in Bolivia, South America in May last year. So I was, this was my first motorbiking following my most recent hip reconstruction. I was eight months post the surgery. So I was doing really bloody pretty well to be back on a bike. And there was one particular day, which I now call the marathon day, where we had an 11 hour riding day. And most of it was on sort of dirt fire tracks, nothing, nothing major technical, but it was like in a really, uh, really tough endurance slog. And I remember like moments in that day where I just, every single inch of my body just said, you're, you're done. Like my hip hurt and I felt like I'd pushed myself way beyond my limits, but I knew that I had to keep going. Like we were in the middle of nowhere. I had to get to that, to the end of that day. Um, and that was probably one of the hardest sort of mental push throughs um, I feel like I've done as far as like the longest ride. Cause it was 11 hours of riding. So our day, once, you know, you stop for a lunch and photos and food and stuff, um, that was pretty tough. Um, and then my hardest ride, I think, was, so I've only done five competitions now, and it was the round one of the British Enduro Championships, so BEC round one, uh, about, it's probably two months ago now, I'm a bit confused on dates because I haven't left the house for so long, everything's kind of emerging. Uh, and it's now known to be the hard, one of the hardest BECs on record. And the timings of the course, anyone who rode it, give me some thumbs up about, or just like sweat emojis of how horrendous it was. I basically rode solidly for six hours in a rut in a pine forest. I managed one bite of a protein bar in the middle and I did not stop for six hours and hurricane oh not hurricane, like a, a named storm hit the UK that day. So the conditions were absolutely horrendous. And I never thought about giving up, but it was like a slog to keep going, if that makes sense. It was just mm. brutal. Um, I mean, one moment I fell off. Don't even, you know when you get so tired that you fall over where you're like, why did I even fall off? So it was this a beautiful burn corner going round. Somehow I managed to fall this way. <laughs> what was I doing? I was exhausted. I just, and my leg was under the bike, and I was just like, I remember lying there. My head was sort of downhill because I'd fallen over the berm. Again, how I did it, whatever. I remember lying there looking around. My bike had obviously turned off, completely silent, looking around, trying to see if I could see a marshal. My leg was completely pinned under the bike. And I was like, what? Oh God, what do I do now? And it took me about five minutes to get out from under the bike because my legs were so pinned under the bike that I couldn't even get my foot to push the bike off me to release. I managed to use, get my heel onto the electric start button, which is thankfully strong enough. I managed to like edge it until it got out. I thought, I, I don't know, I'm sure I saw a squirrel in the tree laughing at me. I was like, I'm going to die here, upside down, on the wrong side of a burn. How did I even do it? Um, with a storm hitting in a pine forest. <laughs> but it was a really hard day. No jokes aside, it was absolutely brutal. It pushed me um, to my limits, that's for sure. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I love this story. <laughs> Why do we do this? How is it so fun, though? Because <laughs> <laughs> we're sick. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, what about a 
crazy race story? Um, oh man. Well, <laughs> there was the rev limiter last year, um, which was kind of a bust for me because it was my first race I ever DNF'd um, because my bike, my bike just quit. And I thought it's because I, I blew the top end, but uh, long story short, it ended up being the putt, the putt, or the, no, I think the main jet was completely plugged. One of the jets was completely plugged and my bike just wouldn't run. Um, but anyways, what happened is uh, I ended up stuck at the bottom of one of the gnarliest hills on the track. So I spent the whole, the whole race just pulling people up. And um, it was really fun for me because I know what it's like when I'm the one racing and I'm praying that someone's going to help me on this messed up hill. And um, to see people's faces when they, when they make eye contact with you and you start walking over to them, you see that relief just set in and it's just, it's really a great feeling. And I, so I spent the whole day just hauling bikes up this gnarly hill and I paid for it dearly. I, my lower back was hooped for like six months after that, but um, I don't know. It was just, it was wild to be a, a part of a, a hard enduro race because I, I honestly haven't done many. Um, but it was great to be a part of it. And then to kind of set aside the racer mentality, uh, set my bike against a tree and just start hauling people up the hill. It was, it was really fun for me. And that's kind of, that's what I like to do. I think that's why I love teaching so much. I, I really enjoy helping other people out on the trail and just, I don't know. It was, it wasn't crazy or anything, but it was, it stuck in my mind. I really had a good time. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like a feel good, feel good story. Help those people out. Um, yeah. Trying to think, my, I think my crazy race story was in that same race I just mentioned where the storm hit. It was my fourth special test. So I'd done this special test before. So, you, you know, you're coming around the corner and you think, yeah, you, I've ridden it before, I know what I'm doing. And I come around and there's a 40 foot pine tree that has just been blown over in this named storm that's hit the UK. And it's like, bam, across, across the track. And I'm like, what am I doing? I'm looking for marshals, there's no one around. Obviously I know I've got to stay within the tapes. So I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm, I'm going over it. <laughs> Thankfully I didn't get <laughs> A warning so it was kind of just like a go, go, go rap rap and I made it over it was huge and um I remember for the next like two minutes I was so stoked that I'd survived and I'd made it over this tree where did this tree come from and was anyone there when it fell how come there was no one around it and all this thing started going through my head and then suddenly I was like hang on a minute Vanessa you're in a race come on stop daydreaming <laughs> about the tree and carry on riding and I spoke to some other people because I was near the back of the of the pack um, and they were like, what tree? That was my tree. Like, oh my goodness, that was a tree. It must have blown down after you went past. <laughs> oh my God, that's too good. <laughs> awesome. <sighs> um, okay. Where are we at? Woo. We've still got four little sections. Um, yep should we just try and like dive through them yeah let's give her um okay. the next next one is your race kit so gear um this question comes up a lot uh people ask me what what gear do you wear and why uh the biggest question i get asked is by women wondering which chest protector i wear so um, that one I'm going to share with you guys because I, I actually really like it. It's kind of hard to find a chest protector that's comfortable. Um, and I finally found it. So this one is like a soft fitted thing. It zips up on the side and it has padding on the front and the back. And the padding is soft. So it molds to the shape of your body. And then on impact, it hardens. So it's... Three it's called... Yeah, yeah. 3DF and it's so it's made by Liat and it's called the th Liat 3DF Airfit and then I wear the light one. So it comes in like a light version or a um heavier version and so that's just depending on how much protection you want and it also comes in either the vest style 
a t-shirt version or a full length arm version. Um, I wear the vest style because I don't like stuff on my arms, but if you're looking for more protection, you can get the one with uh, the short sleeve with the shoulder protection or even a whole arm protection, elbows and forearms and everything. Um, and then, so cool. what else? I wear the same one. You wear the I, same I wear one? It, yeah, it. it is like wearing, I don't know, you say you put your slippers on, it's so comfortable. It is just cuddles you. I wear the full, like the max one of the elbows, the shoulder, everything. Yep. And it's mm -hmm. so comfortable. I love it. Absolutely love it. Really easy to wash when you get sweaty in it. Um, and it just cuddles you. Yeah, I wear the same one. Yeah, that's that's a good thing. The the easy to wash thing is a is a benefit because there's nothing worse than having a big smelly chest protector that can't go in the wash. <laughs> um, what else is there for bike protection? What else? What do you wear? I guess one thing for me when I first got bike protection, I remember Laura at Super MX said to me, she was like, "Right, I understand that right now you're a beginner." But my advice to you is to buy the best protection that you feel like you can afford right now. Because if, if it's something that you end up, that you enjoy and you carry on with, you will in six months, nine months, a year, start to push your riding and be at a point where you probably need that next level of protection. So instead of buying, you know, the budget basic knee, knee pad now, get the one that will actually be good enough for you to continue your journey with. Because if you buy the slightly better knee guard now, you won't then have to upgrade in six months or nine months. So get the best that you can afford right now. Um, and obviously a lot of it comes down to budget when you, what you can afford. But I was so pleased with that because I then bought that Lear Airfit and I've never had to change my, my armor. Um, it's grown with me and I can now do hard enduro in the same armor that kept me safe when I was um, a beginner. Um, so I guess a quick list of what I wear. Um, there is, there's actually a picture on my Instagram of me in my, my bionic body armor. I've recently upgraded to full knee braces because um, I just don't want to do my knee in. For the sake of, the, sake of the money, I've, I've now gone full braces and I, I don't know why I didn't do it sooner actually. They're so I still comfortable. need to do that. That's superb. I've got the Liat ones as well. Um, okay. I'm actually a bit of a Liat, I think. Yeah, so I've got Liat body armor. Liat bum pads. Oh my goodness, they're new to my world. Um, I'm not going to have us bruise the bum now. <laughs> Liat knee braces. And then the obvious of boots, gloves, helmet. Uh, my kind of theory is, is that if I was to fall off and have an accident and then have my family or my husband or even myself go, damn, why wasn't I wearing or why wasn't she wearing the right protection? If I can wear the protection so that that question will never happen, then mm -hmm. you know that's all I can do. Because uh, you yeah. only get one, and I'm going to try and look after it. <laughs> yeah, yep, makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. still need to get on the knee brace bandwagon because I'm currently wearing knee pads just because knee braces are expensive. But um, I really don't want to do my knee in. I don't want to twist it or do something bad to it because a knee injury can be really horrible. So I'm kind of in the market for it. I'm, I, I haven't decided on the brand yeah. I want, but um, that, that'll mm. be my next thing is proper knee braces. But other than that, I've got, of course, boots, helmet, gloves, um, just knee pads and the chest protector um yeah sometimes a neck brace i so i i got a neck brace because i wanted to protect my neck i've had some pretty nasty head injuries and um my neck's been paying the price as well and i find that the neck brace is really hard to wear in hard enduro terrain because of the steep changes you, you know like hills and stuff you can't necessarily look up when you're trying to pick your line on a hill or even look yeah. down far enough when for a re really steep down so i'm struggling with that right now and that's why you don't see me wearing it um as often but um i'm working at working it out right now trying to figure out what i'm gonna do but mm. yeah 
just watching some of the comments, we've had quite a few people saying, do it with the knee braces. I've done my knees. Don't, don't wait. Yeah, yeah. I need to get used to it. I also have an issue with the feel on the bike. When I have too much bulk around my knees, I, I, I feel awkward, but I, I just need to power through that and get used to them. Okay, get used to it and adapt, yeah. 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 Okay, gender. What? We girls. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <That's the next> <laughs> okay. um, I guess this next one's all about, um, do we feel like we're often underestimated or undermined being, you know, girls out there as far as our riding or our mechanical abilities, um, basically? Do you want 100%. to jump into that one? Yeah, of <laughs> course. Um, it's like anything uh, in, in a sport where it's male dominated, it's going to be weird to see women out there doing it. And I think a lot of people underestimate us. Um, or undermine us, like it says in the question, um, a lot of people tend to chime in on posts and, you know, I don't want to get too far into this because we're just going to rip through this, but yes, we definitely get underestimated and undermined as women in the sport. But the thing is that as a, as a female rider, I don't think of it as, well, I'm just a girl. I think of it as, well, I'm, I'm just a rider. I'm, I'm just like any, anyone else. I may have a slight disadvantage because of my size, but the only thing holding me back is just extra practice. Um, we can do anything on the bikes if we set our minds to it. And um, it's just a matter of attitude. You can't go into it thinking you're a lesser rider because of your gender, um, because mm. that's not true. Um, anyone can do anything on a bike. Uh, look at Laya Sands. She's she's incredible she she yeah. kicks the crap out of so many male riders out there and um mm. it's just it's it's your your attitude your energy and your dedication how much time are you willing to put in and um yeah. where do you see yourself ending up if you see yourself always being second best it's not your gender holding you back it's your attitude um, so that's always kind of been my outlook. I, I've always just been right in there with the boys, whether it's, um, riding or s snowboarding or whatever it is I'm doing. I'm an electrician, right? So I'm always kind of jumping into a male dominated everything. Um, but humans are humans. We're, we're all, we, we're all capable. Um, I just try to ignore the people who undermine me or, or, you know, try to give me extra help or whatever, act like I, I can't do it. I just, just ignore those people. Yeah, that's, I love that. I think that arm as well is that I think there are some, I, I don't want to say anything bad about any girls at all ever, but I definitely think there are some girls that don't necessarily help the rest of the girls out. Um, like wearing high heels and thongs on motorbikes. Um, I'm sure it looks awesome on a poster on the wall, but it's not going to give you credibility as a rider. Uh, and I think, I, I mean, I look at you and I hope that I, 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 I'm seen in a similar way, but we just get on with it and we ride. We're not in it to try and look pretty or be like the girl doing it. We're just out there having fun and enjoying it. Um, I think something that I always try to do is almost work extra hard to try and learn more so that I actually can join in and have a chat about the engine and understand some of the mechanics and almost earn a little bit more credibility and respect by putting that extra work in to not be the girl, if that even makes sense. I'm kind of blabbing a bit now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we need to get more girls out there. So if you're a girl and you're watching this, let's ride, okay? <laughs> yeah. We can do it Girl power is the Spice Girl started. Love the Spice Girls. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, um, okay. What's next? Mechanics. So I'm in my mechanics the garage. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, people have been asking, um, how have you learned to work on your own bike and that sort of thing? And for me, it's all been through experiences. So something happens to my bike. If I don't know how to fix it, 
I find someone who does and I learn or I turn to the internet um, mm -hmm. because being able to fix your own stuff is really, really helpful because 90% of the time something breaks on a Saturday night and the shops aren't open and, um, or, you know, you can't afford to just pay shops to fix your stuff all the time. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's really great to kind of know and understand your bike. And to me, that just comes with time and experience as different things happen to the bike. I have to learn how to fix them or why something's happening. And, um, you know, like working on a car, changing a tire, doing a top end. Um, it's all a lot more simple than it seems. And I find if you just kind of jump into it, uh, as long as you have someone help helping you or the guidance of a wonderful YouTube video, um, it's, it's totally doable. I mean, you may not want to just jump, jump in on a bottom end on a four stroke, uh, for your first bike maintenance thing, the but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's no, but, um, I, I think it's any, anyone can learn if they want. You just uh, need some guidance. I always turn to my friends. Yeah. 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 YouTube, the bike manual, the bike manual is like mm -hmm. gold mine, which I think a lot of people overlooked and then giving it a go, you know, change your own oil for the first time. One thing I like to think about is that the worst thing that can happen is that you don't fix the problem and you have to get someone to fix it for you anyway, which is what you would have done if you hadn't tried, which means you don't actually lose anything other than a little bit more of a learning curve. Whereas next time you would be able to do it your own because you then figured out you've got, you almost got nothing to lose. Um, obviously with some of the bigger stuff, I mean, it could go quite wrong if you put your bearing ins upside down or something, <laughs> but starting on the basics, helps you actually build like a bond especially if you named your bike you can build a bond with them with the name come on more names we want more name suggestions <laughs> i name all my bikes and Meg doesn't name her bike so we need two names for her bike so how's the ktm come on um and now i've lost my chain of thought classic <laughs> <laughs> bike names <laughs> yeah, um, so, oh no no I've lost my chain of thought. Um, talking about fixing bikes. <laughs> Give it a go. Oh, no, I know what it is. If you look after your bike and learn and sort of get to know how it works, when you're out on the trail, that could be the difference between pushing it home or managing to get it working again or mid-race or something. You're also mm -hmm. going to save a lot of money because a topic we've got, actually the next topic is about the cost of enduro because it's not cheap, you know? There are ways to make it a little bit cheaper, like trying to learn and do your own mechanics. I don't think we could have the bikes that we have if we had to pay someone to look after them straight up. So, you know. uh, and for me, I've learned as I've gone along, there are loads of things on a bike that I haven't got a clue about still, but that's okay when something goes wrong. As you said earlier, you know, you look it up, you ask for help. I'm really lucky that I've got a husband who's an engineer. So he's like my hero pit boy that helps with with teaching me and coaching me through stuff um and you know i'll learn how to fix that when that thing goes wrong so it's an ever expanding like journey and growth and it's fun really um, and loads of comments are like yeah well you've got a bike frame in the background um yeah that's the ktm being rebuilt so <laughs> <laughs> oh the engine's directly behind me there you go um, yeah, put a new piston and clutch in it earlier today and then got distracted. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, I think we've covered that one. Oh, good question. Okay, the cost one, I'm going to fire it straight at you. If you had £200 or $200 to spend on your brand new bike as like the, the thing that you do to it and you only have 200 what would you do? Okay. Um, so only $200 scares me a little bit because the first thing I want to do to my bike is suspension. Um, so if I could stretch that and, and get my bike resprung for $200, that's what I would do. Um, if not, I would, <laughs> and you guys are going to laugh at me and make fun of me, but I would take off the stock Dunlop AT81 tire 
and throw it away and put a gummy tire on the back with a moose in it. <laughs> um, but suspension is always my first thing. Being a smaller rider, um, it may, it's the difference between night and day. Like, it needs to be yeah. re-sprung for sure. Um, it's ever since I started getting my suspension set up properly for me, my riding has um, improved like crazy. I think when I first put the right uh, spring rated, uh, sorry, weight rated spring in my KTM, I honestly think I was 20% faster immediately because I wasn't just being ragdolled by the standard spring. Obviously, mm -hmm. a lot of people will fit the standard spring because it's made to fit the average rider. But for me, I need a considerably um, light, lighter spring weighting for, for my weight. And yeah, it made a huge difference. Okay, yeah. so if I had 200, um, I think spring straight away would be the first thing if I can get that done. And if you were just to do, put, in England anyway, if you were to just put a, a different weighted spring in, you would be able to do it for 200. But if not, it would be bike protection because it costs a lot it does cost a lot of money to put the the bike protection on but it's like a, a short-term cost for not having the repair cost later um yeah. so things like having the guards that are going to protect your levers from being snapped every time you go out or, or drop it um, the protections on on pipes on chains on sprockets um uh, i'm trying i'm looking at a bike trying to work out where the protection is I think Rad I'm tired. <laughs> yeah. Am I starting yeah. to make less sense, people? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Um, okay. The last one in that question is: What's the most important, expensive part of enduro, and what can we do to try and minimise it? So I think we kind of just ticked part of it that, like, the damage and the the breakage is expensive. So putting protection on the bike can reduce the cost later. Yeah. Um, but what do you reckon anything else that you can think of there? Um, just regular maintenance. So avoid something nasty happening to your top end, right? By properly doing it every however many hours. Um, air filter is huge. Maintaining your air filter can can save you so much money, right? You don't. Sorry, my Ooh, phone's about to die. Um, you you don't want her getting through your air filter and that'll save you a top end. So maintain your bikes, change your oil, uh, whether it's a four stroke or a two stroke, change your gear oil or your engine oil. Um, do your air filter um, as often as you need um, and just check things, check your fluids, check, check your brake pads, um, things like that. Yeah, look after the bike and it will look after you, but it might yeah. still throw you on the ground. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Cool. Um, okay, we've got some quick fire questions now, haven't we? We're nearly, we're nearly up. Um, this has been so much fun. I hope everyone is, is enjoying it. We've got a couple more questions. If you can stick with us for a little bit longer, thumbs up if you're happy for us to keep going. I can already see a thumb up. That's awesome. Um, okay, best places you've ridden and where you've ridden and learned the most. So there's two okay. answers to that question. Okay. Okay, so best place I've ridden so far is new to me. I just, I, it was recent, and that was at a place called Wellsville in beautiful Ohio. Yay! Um, <laughs> everyone's told me that Ohio is a crappy place. And once I got there and rode there, I realized that it was amazing. And the reason it was so amazing was because it had giant boulder fields. It had creeks that we were allowed to ride up. It had waterfalls. It had really slippery clay ruts. It had hill climbs galore. And it had the best people ever. Um, I met some amazing people out there and absolutely pushed my skills to the limits. Like I, I was only out there for uh, about a month and I became a better rider, Be just, just riding there. So um, that's it, you guys, Wellsville, Ohio. Um, Is it? Oh, I'm adding that to the list. Oh I man, need... you have to. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay. Yeah. Cool. And what about where you'd le have learned the most? Um, well, that's the same place, I guess. I mean, it was because it's so okay. slippery, right? And so technical. Like in the boulder fields, I'll try not to drone on because my phone is about to die. But in the boulder fields, like you absolutely had to level up with your skills to get through there. Uh, in the slippery terrain, I had to manage my traction with the clutch. Um, it was such an awesome place to learn and get become a better rider. Nah, that sounds yeah. amazing. Yeah. Well, okay. so I think my favorite place I've ridden is actually Sardinia, a uh, small island of Italy. There is so much legal hard enduro riding just going off into the mountains. It was incredible. Um, I rode with a tour enduro Sardinian, the a tour company hired a bike out there. And it was a combination of epic terrain where, I mean, we did like 10K in a riverbed of totally legal riding and up over crags and mountains. And um, it's a sort of terrain where you can do the easiest stuff or the hard stuff, push yourself as much as you want. And I'd say that's like my best place I've ridden so far. Um, and the place where I learned the most is probably going to be really obvious when I say it, but it was actually Graham Jarvis's school in Spain. Um, had days riding out there, and they really push you. They uh, they know how to look at your level and work out where those step ups can be, and to freaking push you there. Uh, I learned a lot. So, That's yeah. cool. Yeah, that nice. was cool. Uh, uh, cool. Oh. Anyone our last question? Stick, stick it, stick with us, guys. Our last one. <laughs> There's one more. Balancing, yeah. balancing riding with a full time job. <sighs> <laughs> That's a can of worms, hey. Um, so, yeah. balance. How do you balance having a full time job and still get better as a rider? Um, this is a good question for me because I've been doing it for years, guys. Um, and what I've found is that if you're working a lot, um, I was working these long days, um, six days a week, um, you will make time. So the best thing you can do, I guess, is take time in the evenings if, you're, if you really wanna better your skills, and do those at home drill sessions where you're balancing or anything you can do without actually turning on your bike and getting the cops called on you for riding around in the neighborhood. Um, but making that time on the one or two days a week you have to at least get some riding in. Um, mm. But then you got to balance having fun um, and getting out with your friends and uh, grinding and doing drills. I find that not a lot of people find both those things fun. They have fun or they have drills. For me, drills are really fun because I'm kind of sick in the head. Um, <laughs> so that's cool. But um, if you don't enjoy the drills, maybe you should find a way to enjoy them so that you can make the best of your time on the bike, but still progress. Because progression comes from dedicated practice. So you can go out every weekend with your friends and go on a fun trail ride. And yes, you will get better with seat time, but you will get better exponentially faster if you do dedicated practice. And what that means mm -hmm. is focusing on an, as a specific skill and working on that, working on that. Um, and then once you finally get that, move on to the next skill and work on that. It could be logs. It could be a specific way of crossing a log, right? Like really break things down and work on things step by step. And that's how, that's how you grow as a rider uh, in the quickest way, uh, if that makes sense. And um, so if, so to answer the question, how do you get better while still working full time? You use your time wisely and do dedicated practice. Yeah, good. <laughs> Good time management and using that time wisely is, is a really good one. And if you're passionate about it, you will find a way to make the time for it. Um, uh, cause, you know, you'll find fixing your bike on a Tuesday night 
more exciting than watching that Netflix program or, you know, I know a lot of people have kids and stuff like that, which is really hard. I can't even imagine that one here. Um, but it's just about, you know, following that passion and you know, trying to shape life to fit around it or it fit around life, whichever way it works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I just realized the time we yep. are on a uh, hour, like cut out on the Instagram live, which means we're probably getting really close to our second hour. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> um, we have been talking so much. Um, yeah. I feel like there's still so much more that we could talk about. So everyone that's listening, if there's something that we just haven't touched on or you've, you've asked us a question in the comments, please drop us a, a, a DM, a direct message, and we can gather up anything that, you know, that we've missed out and left and see if it's going to make sense to try and do another session. Um, yep. Give us a feedback, what you've liked about it, what you haven't. Um, Make sure you follow us both. <laughs> and are we allowed to I do that? Is that too much? Facebook, I Instagram, YouTube. Megs is amazing on YouTube, by the way. <laughs> thank you. And I want to thank you guys very much for tuning in. Um, we really appreciate your support. And you guys made our afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, uh, really wonderful. So thank you very much. Yay. <laughs> Wait, is this about to hang up? Do we do the yeah, I guess so. We'll hang up. <laughs> I'll talk to you guys later. I'll end this thing. Cool. <laughs> Thanks, Bye. everyone. Awesome to speak with you. Bye. <laughs>